So we're thrilled to welcome back to the school Colin Coleman. Colin was here in 2016 uh, for the Africa Business Forum. Um, now, you have his little bio, or you have his bio in your little kind of flip books there, but you know, just for those of you who hadn't, hadn't had a chance to look at it yet, um, you know, we often think about business and government and civil society in separate buckets. But many of the successful people that we've brought to the school have worked across those, those, various, uh, those various areas, and Colin has done that. He's currently the head of the Investment Banking Division for Sub-Saharan Africa for Goldman Sachs, um, a role that he's held since 2000. But in the 1980s, he was involved in South Af Africa's anti-apartheid movement and later in its constitutional transition. From 89 to 94, he was executive director for the Consultative Business Movement, and maybe you can tell us more about that along the way. Uh, served in, in many of the work multi-party talks, facilitated international mediation forum, helped negotiate the agreement to facilitate all parties' participation in, in the 1994 elections. Previously, he worked at the Bank for in, the Bank International Court, uh, SBIC, and as an advisor to the SBIC chairman, and he was also at Standard uh, Corporate and at J.P. Morgan. Uh, he was nominated as one of the World Economic Forum's global leaders for tomorrow and a recipient of the CBM, on behalf of CBM, of another business school's business statement <laughs> award. Uh, we'll have to come up with one of those awards so we can give it to you, Colin. Uh, so please welcome Colin. Colin. And by now you know the drill, I'll ask some questions, and then about halfway through, it's your turn, and you have to come up with questions and be prepared not to get hit in the head with the microphone as it gets tossed to you. Um, let's start with politics in South Africa. Uh, recent election, uh, what's your perspective on what we've been through and what might be ahead? Well, well firstly, let me thank Bank of America, Merrill Lynch. It's great to have, uh, have you sponsor this conference. <laughs> I, I think what he's saying is that if you clap loud enough, Goldman Sachs will sponsor this next time. <laughs> you heard it here first. Please. You know, I'm, I'm now really old, so I'm 55, so I know, I know after lunch I have to check if the audience is still awake. Uh, clearly you are. Uh, you smart students from Oxford. Uh, so I'm, I'm intimidated, I'm nervous, and I'm very privileged to be here. And uh, I really enjoyed the 2016 uh, discussion. So, uh, look, I'm very excited. I think Mark Lamberti, who you saw earlier, would, would, would also say we're all very excited about the new opportunity in South Africa. Uh, the way I think about it, Peter, I think I, going back two years, would have said the engine rooms of Africa really have to fire. The engine rooms, particularly of South Africa, Nigeria, and Egypt, uh, have to fire. And the other countries are all important. I know I don't want to be attacked by you guys from Kenya or any other country. <laughs> um, they're all important. But if you don't have these major countries firing, you know, you don't have a, a, a machine that's operating on proper cylinders. So South Africa switching on the engine of growth. We've been 1% growth rate for four years, and now really should be 3% average growth rate moving to 5% growth rate. It's a real opportunity for the whole of Africa to get going. And, you know, we were, I was actually reading something just before I got to the school that I said in October, which is South Africa fa faced a binary moment. We were either going to go on with the politics of patronage in South Africa, or we're going to effectively opt and choose the constitutionalist modernizing route of Sir Ramaphosa, and I sat in the December ANC conference for 30 hours representing business leadership of South Africa, observing the conference, and it was very close. But you know, when power shifts, it shifts decisively, and once, de once power shifts decisively, then you have a whole reorientation, and that's what you've seen. With it, you've seen an asset repricing of the bond market, you've seen an asset repricing of equities, and of the exchange rate. Just to put it in perspective, the, the Rand dollar has gone from 1450 in November uh, to 1180 as it came into the room. It's had a little bit of a wobble around the land reform issue, which I'm sure you'll, you'll want to talk, talk about. about that, yeah. But you know, we're talking about 1150 at the strongest. So at 1180, you know, the, the ball is still pretty shiny. And uh, I think it's very, very exciting. But so exciting because I think in January, you said it was the emerging market story of the year. So of that's a big cluster of, of countries we're talking about. 
and you think South Africa is the emerging market story of the year? Well, to clarify, Goldman Sachs equity research, what we call a strategy research, you know, in research world, you've got to understand what research pocket is talking about what thing. So economic research are talking about one thing. Strategy research, equity research are talking about another. This was the strategy research. Mm -hmm. And they said uh, it was basically titled, Is South Africa the Emerging Market Story of 2018? Effectively, what I was saying is South Africa has been so underperforming for so long relative to all other emerging markets. The asset bounce back potential is so great that in terms of potentially credit, particularly credit, local credit, and uh, the currency, we should see that snapback. And that's why on a relative basis. But what is it a function of? It's a function of stabilizing commodity prices are good for Africa. Uh, it's a function of um, confidence and sentiment improving. And it's a, a function of other global pressures effectively working their way through the South African economic system. In particular, the current account deficit coming from almost 5% down to 2.5% currently, uh, and the disinflationary pressures brought about by a strengthening currency, by the oil price stabilization, uh, and other things. So our inflation outlook is pretty, pretty positive. Great. Um, now, I th before we came in, you and Mark and I were talking, and I think whether it was you or Mark throughout the statistics, there are 16 million people working and 9 million not working in South Africa. That doesn't seem like a particularly good ratio. So what are the solutions for that? Uh, again, I was reading on the way in, uh, President Ramaphosa does something called the Ramaphosa Health Walks, and he did one this morning, and he said in this, you know, on this walk, as reported, that the thing he wakes about, uh, he, he stays awake about at night and worries about during the day is jobs. Mm -hmm. and, and, and it's driving his under, underarching economic policy. Uh, and it, absolutely, the key question is what is, the in, what is the environment that needs to be created to drive job creation? Um, 19 million, sorry, 16 million people working, 9 million people not working is a terrible circumstance. Uh, and of that 9 million, 6 million are under the age of 34. So you have a very large youth unemployment problem. Uh, so there are things that we are doing which are designed to, let's say, help mitigate the problem of the marginalized unemployed youth problem. In particular, Stephen Kosser from Investec, the CEO of Investec, and myself for the CEO initiative have been driving what I think is an unparalleled, unprecedented uh, attempt in the world, actually, which is to create a movement uh, in business to bring one million unemployed youth into the job market between the ages of 18 and 34, uh, partly um, incentivized by the state, uh, but in effect bringing those people into paid internships in business for one year. Uh, and we are launching that uh, in the course of this month. Uh, and hopefully that will ramp up to 330,000 a year for three years. And this will be a massive organizational job. If you think of uh, any one company bringing, let's say, 3,000, if they're 30,000 people uh, in a bank, for example, and they bring 3,000 interns, not only is costly, but it's a big organizational process to bring those people in, to train them, to accredit them, to give them a proper work experience, and at the same time to make sure that those people are looked after throughout the one year. But that's really, I would say, a way of managing the current problem, it's not resolving the unemployment problem. The unemployment problem is really going to be resolved by a couple of things. One is much higher growth rates, which is really a function of how do we get what was, what was called by President Ramaphosa the New Deal, which is now played out in the State of the Nation, the January 8th statement that uh, came out recently, with a whole bunch of economic reforms, including state-owned enterprise reforms, uh, driving uh, small business, uh, and so on and so forth, uh, in fixing the mining charter, facilitating a bunch of these structural economic reforms that the rating agencies are watching very carefully. And then in the medium term, dealing with something that I'm really, Peter, hoping that Oxford is going to help a lot in providing meat around the bone, which is how do we deal with the tectonic plates in the world of China, which is guzzling commodities and driving industrial growth, and Africa is feeding the commodities into China on the one hand, and on the other hand, the innovation of, of uh, Silicon Valley and technology 
in the United States and the huge changes that are going in, undertaking in the production process. There's another economic report by Goldman Sachs that talks about the technology changes in manufacturing and in productivity and who the companies are that are driving that and capturing. And it's fasc absolutely fascinating to read it, but it's also very frightening because if robotics, machinery, internet of things, all of that is going to drive the production process in the fourth industrial revolution in a different way, then it's also going to displace workers and going to upskill the requirements of workers to meet those needs. So in the middle of that, the opportunity is this, and I know you, your, your topic of your conference is the consumer phenomenon in Africa and redefining the African consumer. Well, actually, there's 1.2 billion Africans that is going to grow to 1.7 billion by the year 2030. So when I went recently to Silicon Valley, I asked one of the presidents of one of the largest corporations in the world, what would it take for you to decide to relocate your manufacturing of your pro products into South Africa, and what are the incentives that need to be there? Now we're talking about special economic zones, we're talking about labor incentives, fiscal incentives and others, but we have to have a live discussion with these companies to say, for the one and a half billion or 1.7 billion Africans, what are you going to do? Are you going to manufacture your technology and export it from the United States? Or are you actually going to start to manufacture it in Africa, for Africa, and potentially for export elsewhere, if we can get the logistics right? And obviously, South Africa has a huge infrastructure, legal um, framework, financial services, all of the necessary facilitation, and it's much better for Africa if we're getting uh, that product developed in Africa, and obviously very good for South Africa. But I believe in the long term, I'm sorry I'm going on a little bit, yep. but it's really exercising my mind is, what do we as Africans do to take what apparently is going to be 85 million workers that are going to be displaced out of China because their cost of labor is getting too high, if we, can, if we can attract into South Africa 1%, that's 1 million jobs, we can attract 2%, you know, we're really hitting the charts. And what Ethiopia is doing with their industrial parks and labor incentives is actually pretty far in front. But unfortunately, their legal system and a variety of other things don't pertain there. And they don't have the depth of infrastructure and uh, legal and financial services that South Africa has. So, I'm not saying that South Africa must compete with Ethiopia. Every one of the countries should be saying, asking themselves, how do we capture the share from China? And how do we attract these Silicon Valley giants with net cash of a trillion dollars and market caps for the top 10 uh, you know, of, of close to $5 trillion? How do we attract them to manufacture their products in Africa for Africa? So that's an interesting question. When Amazon's already putting to bid out, you know, where should our next headquarters be? And we're seeing, you know, kind of uh, saber rattling and more on tariffs and seeing increasing nationalism. So I guess I'll turn your question around on you. How do you think that could be done? Well, people have to compete. I mean, there's, there's no question. You know, when I look, uh, if you had to ask me, because I know this is an African conference, I don't want to speak just about South Africa. When I go and visit Rwanda and you speak to President Gigami, who's really a quite brilliant manager. I mean, if you're talking about a manager president, he's a manager president. I'm hoping that Sir Ramaphosa uh, will be that manager president for South Africa. I know somebody called him the South African CEO president. And it, it, in a way, I think that's what he is. He has that capability. But, but Rwanda has this very, very disciplined way of monitoring, giving objectives to the ministries, monitoring, and then McKinsey-like or Bain-like or uh, the management consultants effectively getting reports and then, and then working through that. And I think, you know, the more that more countries are disciplined in managing their resources, the better. The problem for Rwanda is they're a $10 billion GDP com uh, a country growing at 10%. That sounds phenomenal, but that means they're only adding $1 billion a year. Mm -hmm. So that in 10 years, there'll be $10 billion, uh, $10 billion more, $20 billion, but that's still a very small country. So the only way Rwanda can actually make progress is if the trade, ba uh, the trade barriers in Africa fall away. And what I'm, the model I'm talking about is one in which South Africa helps the trade barriers fall away so we can become 
uh, credible when we stand in front of Apple or Google or Amazon or anybody else and say, you know, come and manufacture in Rwanda for Africa or come and manufacture in Angola for Africa or come and manufacture in South Africa for Africa, and it truly means for Africa, for the one and a half billion people, not for the 55 million in South Africa or the $10 billion GDP in Rwanda because, you know, there's corruption on the borders and there's inability to get movement of goods and people, which we have to do away with. So that's, um, you know, I, I know we dr we're in the realm of dreaming, but, you know, we're in Oxford and uh, <laughs> we're with brilliant students and students have to dream. Please do not create your future based on old farts like me. Um, you know, you've got to create your future based on your own vision. So I'm helping you create a vision, and then you've got to try and create a world that doesn't exist. The world that exists is uh, protectionist, full of corruption, you know, full of barriers, you know, and we've got to just bring those down. So the spires dream, you have to do more than dream. You actually have to get stuff done. Uh, that's the message there. Um, now, one of the things you said that was important was rule of law uh, in attracting companies. Uh, recently, in the last month or so, this whole land expropriation or threat of land expropriation in South Africa um, has been, well, I think you personally have spoken about this in the press. So could you kind of enlighten the audience about what that is and, and talk to how that speaks to rule of law? So um, at the ANC ruling party conference in December, where they elected the leadership, they had a bunch of economic policies. One of the policies they adopted was to effectively change the constitution such that, uh, whereas the constitution doesn't allow for expropriation of land without compensation to allow for it. Um, and this obviously for, let's say, the Afro-pessimists uh, in, um, in the world is a sort of Zimbabwe signal land grab signal. Um, so we have to try and give content to what it means. Now I would just sort of step back and say between a very bad outcome at the one end and a highly rational outcome at the other end is a very wide range, a very wide spectrum of outcomes. At the bad end is threatening property rights. At the good end is respecting property rights but taking account of historical uh, land um, uh, issues or challenges, and at the same time, underutilized or unutilized land production owned by people who have no, no intention of using it, and therefore they should lose it. Um, and so in this wide spectrum, there's going to be a process in South Africa which is going to have a constitutional, a commercial, a legal, a farming, a production, and a historical overlay. And all of those overlays are going to get, give expression in the institutions, the constitutional court, in the uh, parliament, in the media, in the civil society, and everything else. And like South Africa has proven, it's a highly contested world, and that's one of the beauties of its resilience, is that you know, nothing happens overnight. There's no one person who dictates. It's a, it's a real process. So I'm confident, and I've said this recently, that there will be a process to get us to a rational solution. And the rational solution will be more likely at the end I've, I've described. Uh, but the reality, Peter, is for companies and investors right now who are thinking about investing mm -hmm. in 20, 30-year projects, they don't know where mm -hmm. this is going to come out. So what we're hoping to do is to quickly have a, a message come from people of authority in South Africa that says property rights are sacrosanct. Yes, we have to have land, um, a, a debate about the land. We have to have a debate about historically, uh, la historical land that's been seized inappropriately or un unlawfully returned to the people in the process. Uh, we have to have consideration for food production, for agriculture production, uh, and for support mechanisms. Uh, but we're not talking about property rights, you know, being under threat. And therefore, if you build a factory uh, in South Africa to produce mobile phones, you know, you're not going to find in five years' time that your land is seized and your factory is seized and you don't have it anymore. Mm -hmm. You talked about tectonic plates, and one of them was China. Uh, 
Now, I suspect that there's a counterpart of you in Goldman Sachs that is doing financing in China and supporting Chinese companies and, and others to do business in Africa. So given that Goldman Sachs is on both sides of this equation, uh, I think you'd be recently uh, in a good position to talk about what are the pros and cons, or what do you see about China's current intentions and actions in Africa? So this goes back now 10 years. You know, I did the ICBC Standard Bank deal 2007, 2008, uh, you know, one of the most exciting transactions I've done in my career, and, and various other things. So I, w I would say in that time, uh, if I can give it a sort of historical perspective, 10 years ago, I think it was very clear that there was a China Inc. strategy which said we are going through our state-owned enterprises to up the game to see what historical relationship we can build over the next century to drive Africa-China relations, trade, investment. There's been a bit of discovery, as with all relationships, you get to know the person and the party better, you get to know their problems, and so on. Part of the problems are, yes, there's lots to be done and lots of um, deficits, infrastructure deficits in Africa, which the Chinese are very well placed to fulfill. But the institution planning in Africa the regulatory overlay is extremely weak. So the bankability of projects put before the Chinese is underwhelming, as seen by the Chinese. So Africa has to get better at presenting bankable projects which are competent and able for the Chinese to invest in. So the institutions have more money than there are projects to invest uh, in, in, in Africa. And at the same time, there's criticisms about the nature of the relationship between Chinese contractors and the African governments and they're the backhanders and not backhanders. And in South Africa, we had a, a, we had a you know, particular case uh, where there was an, a transport infrastructure project uh, where the Gupta family is alleged to have got paid something like five billion rand for a, um, a, a, a transport deal as a finder fee. Five billion rand is like half a billion dollars. Uh, it's really incredible. Um, in relation to a Chinese contracted firm. So, so, you know, there are going to be problems, but there's also been a huge amount of progress. I mean, there's not a place I go to where the stadium or the airport or many of the roads are not built by the Chinese. And you, you, so there's practical assistance to African countries emerging, and there's lots of financing to countries like Nigeria who've hit walls because of their own problems uh, where, um, where China is being facilitative and helpful. Uh, but I would say the Silk Road uh, initiative of the Chinese President Xi uh, is going to renew the energy of the China-Africa relations. So I think we, we had this sort of initial spark 10 years ago. It's gone through its ups and downs. It's had its successes, had its negatives. But I think now we're going to have a new engine come on with the Silk Road. Lots of capital that's obviously there uh, for investment. And good news, South Africa is starting to you know, look good again. Nigeria potentially turning around. I, I'm sort of cautious, but I think they've, they've gone through their heart attack on the uh, FX flows. And so you should be able to see more uh, economic uh, activity happening in Nigeria. And you know, other parts of Africa are starting to pick up and the commodity prices are much more stable. So I think with that, the, the stage is set for a, a new chapter in the China-Africa affair. Great. Let's talk about Goldman Sachs for a little bit. Um, so Goldman Sachs is a big global firm. How do you see Africa and the part of the firm that you deal with, or you're running, uh, fitting in with the rest of the firm? What's the rest of the Goldman's, the senior leadership teams, thoughts about Africa. Obviously, you live there, you, you live it, you breathe it, you, you know, it's your life. But how does Africa fit into the broader Goldman Sachs organization? Yeah. So I'm, I've been there 18 years. I've been a partner now for eight. Uh, we have about a thousand um, Africans, um, sorry, a thousand Goldman Sachs people touch Africa. Uh, we have probably a hundred Africans working in the firm around Africa and we have 20 people in the Johannesburg office. So it's a typical Goldman Sachs uh, hub and satellite model. So 
you know, I, the, the engine and the heart is in New York, London, Hong Kong, Beijing uh, for us. And, you know, we are feeding it uh, from the Joburg satellite office, but then we attract a thousand people into projects. So the institutional memory in, in Goldman Sachs now about African, African clients and South African opportunities and the China Africa issues and all the cross border stuff is well developed. I would say we have a good institutional memory and there's some people in the audience here from Goldman Sachs uh, who work with us. So it's across securities, across investment banking, private wealth, asset management, everybody's sort of there. But you know, when I go and see Lloyd Blankfein um, or any of the senior leadership of Goldman Sachs, I mean, it's clear that it would be true to say that um, Africa has done well and we're proud of the African efforts of Goldman Sachs. But at the moment, it's something more akin to an option on the future than an actual current present huge business. You know, the business in Africa uh, in terms of a percentage of the $34 billion revenue of Goldman Sachs is relatively small. Now, that's not unusual for any business. Russia would be the same or Australia or, or other places. Um, but, you know, this should be a billion dollar business. Um, and we need Africa to rise in order for it to be the case. So obviously having been now outside of South Africa, in Africa uh, for 10 years or so seriously trying to build the business, it's going slower than we would like, but it's fast enough for us to be patient, to be there, to be committed, uh, and to be building that institutional memory. So, you know, we, we see Africa as, uh, as probably Goldman Sachs would have seen China 30 years ago, you know, as a, uh, a potentially very large market, uh, that we have to invest in, we have to build our relationships, but we hope it becomes much more active and much more engaged than it is. Okay. I'm going to ask one more question and then it's over to you. And this last one is not about Africa and it's not about uh, consumers. It's about Larry Fink's BlackRock letter, um, which he penned in January and sent to all their clients saying, you know, uh, responsibilities of business are higher than they were ever before. And then it was followed in short shrift, I think, by letters of a similar type by Vanguard and State Street. So what do you see as Goldman Sachs' responsibilities beyond making Goldman Sachs partners wealthy? <laughs> <laughs> it must be someone else. Um, <laughs> and shareholders, too, of course. No, look, I mean, I don't want to sound like a you know, Goldman Sachs uh, sausage machine um, <laughs> expressing the, uh, the ambassadorial sort of views. But I can genuinely say, having been 18 years, I mean, Goldman is a, a great firm. JP Morgan is a great firm. Bank of America is a great firm. Um, these are highly sophisticated, very thoughtful organizations with great people in them. Um, and I would say the you know, the genuine DNA of these firms is to understand that sustainability of the profitability of financial institutions, of companies, has to do more with the sustainability of society. And it starts with the world and the environment, and that plays itself, I was telling Peter, you know, plays itself out now. We, we have compliance. The minute something comes in about natural resources or coal or mining or under, deep underground mining related financing, we have certain compliance processes to go through internally in committees to review the suitability of doing things because we're concerned about the future of the world and the sustainability of that, but also the liabilities associated with that. Um, and, and then obviously we're concerned about how do we support society. So the 10,000 small business, 10,000 women, uh, all of that uh, type of activity is part of that. The support I personally get from Goldman Sachs to be involved in the CEO initiative, this youth employment uh, issues, uh, all of that. I spend a huge amount of my time not directly with clients uh, dealing with society issues and helping to produce sustainable outcomes for Africa and it's, and it's supported. And I talk publicly about it and that's not necessarily something Goldman normally does because we understand the importance of these issues. So. Um, I, I don't think, look, uh, 
Let's just say capitalism is not perfect <laughs> by any means. Capitalism, Wall Street is not perfect. Goldman Sachs is not perfect. But I think there is a growing consensus about what mode of capitalism or human capital or society or partnerships is needed in order to create a much more sustainable environment, even for those who are well, well paid in the world. Excellent. Over to you young people to ask questions. So who'd like to start? Why don't you pitch it up here and then uh, we'll start with up here. Okay. Thanks, Peter. Um, Colin, my name is Denver. Uh, I'm a health economist and I work for a company called Engaged Health. Uh, my question relates to, um, do you think uh, Africa needs to create federal unions, um, even if only on paper, to enhance the rate of growth? Because surely the, the siloed attempts are going to result in the Rwandan outlook of you know, one billion a year. Do you want me to answer yeah. one? So, so I, you know, um, I sort of hesitate to say it, but the history will show that Gaddafi was a person who called for uh, all of the barriers between African countries to fold and to have one African uh, union. Um, but so it's an interesting question. What, should we be a United States of Africa in which all the barriers are removed for trade, for people, for investment, and so on and so forth? Or should we remain 54 countries and with regional blocks and all the institutions and the people and the overlay of bureaucracy that attaches to that. You know, if you could wave a magic wand, you'd almost say, you know, this idea of having uh, borderless trade and movement of people is a great idea for Africa. And with that, you would be able to much more seamlessly get flow of trade and goods and services, and therefore the market would effect effectively operate as more a one and a half billion people market than country by country. But the reality is so far removed from that in terms of currencies, in terms of economies, in terms of borders, the, uh, even the income generated by visas. And um, you know, it's commonly known that the route to getting really wealthy in places like Nigeria is being by, by being a customs officer. <laughs> you know, so, these are, these are the realities, but again, we have to dream, and I would dream of a United uh, States of Africa in which there's borderless trade flows, people flows, and investment flows within Africa. We're doing a little experiment about that. It's called the EU, so. <laughs> in the back, um, somebody in the back. No? Well, in that case, I think you, yeah? Boxes near you. Okay. Please, go ahead. Hi, I'm Giorgio. I'm a one plus one MBA here at Oxford. And um, I wanted to know what advice you can offer to social entrepreneurs who are not from the continent but want to engage with the African markets and consumers. Well, the thing about, um, I'd say the, technolo the global technology companies is they're really resolving real problems uh, in many cases, real problems amongst people that are solving real issues. So whether they're health issues or education or it's creating technologies, transport issues. I mean, when you listen to Travis from Uber describe where did Uber come from? I don't know if you've, you've heard the story, but apparently, well, I, I've heard it from him. Uh, he was enormously frustrated waiting in Paris for a cab. And he got so frustrated, he said to his, this person with him, I'm going to start a company that gets me a cab online. And that was the essential trigger of, so he's solving a real problem that he has on the street. So I'm just, if you take that concept of solving real problems, you know, whether you're Spanish or Cuban or uh, German, solving problems in Africa doesn't really matter. But if you're solving the problems of nutrition, homelessness, inability to get decent education, uh, private health online, uh, insurance, which doesn't exist, banking, which doesn't exist. Look at what's going on with the mobile phones and uh, with, with online banking and so on and so forth. All of these things, that is the germ of 
servicing these problems. So I would say for social entrepreneurs, actually the most wealth creation that's happened in my lifetime has been around providing technology to solve real problems and to move the ball forward. And, and that's, that's what you would be doing, wherever you're doing it, uh, you can service the African customer. Yeah, uh, hello. Yeah. My name is Don Sconte, and I've worked in Africa exporting commodities into Europe and the UK before I came here and studied at the LSE, and I'm here. We're still trying to do things. But I want to go back to the previous question, which you mentioned about African unity and that sort of thing, which I believe is, politically speaking, that train has left that station. It won't happen. But what I want to ask Goldman Sachs, given that you're one of the global players in capitalism, um, what are you doing to access or to develop intra-African distribution delivery of goods and services between African countries? What is your contribution? Because let's say, for example, the Chinese, who somebody has described as the political economic carpet baggers, if you like, they did what you, um, the West failed to do for 40 years after independence. For example, they went into Djibouti. You know, Djibouti, Uganda, Eritrea to Ethiopia, they are landlocked. So they built a train that connected all these countries, and in building the train, they use uh, young people from secondary schools as trainee engineers during the construction of the train station, of the train line. And these people will be the future managers of, these, uh, of the train. And that kind of uh, concept, I mean, what will Goldman Sachs do to encourage that, because you guys have more experience than the Chinese in Africa. Yeah. So the, the beauty about investment banking um, is, in a position like mine or uh, people like me, uh, is if you use your imagination and if you use the networks of a global firm, you're connecting the world. So let's just uh, let's talk about the slogan "connecting the world with Africa." So whether it's ICBC into Africa, or it's Walmart into Africa through MassMart, uh, or Vodafone uh, into Africa through Safaricom and other places, building technology, building management, building skills, uh, right across um, the oil sector, the energy sector, etc., etc., we effectively are facilitating both the financing and also the internet, the, the connectivity between these companies and Africa. And that's what we, we're doing actively. I'll give you one example of what we haven't done, but I'd love to do. I went to Silicon Valley a month ago. I saw a number of companies. I gave you a hint of what I was talking to them about already. The one person I didn't see was South African Elon Musk. I'd like to see him because I'd like to say to Elon, uh, Elon, there's the biggest business opportunity for you in front of you in Africa, which is taking your... Um, your um, battery-fired energy, home battery energy, into Africa on a big scale. It's a great business. Why, don't, why aren't we driving a big business when we have diesel, fired up, uh, diesel energy throughout uh, Nigeria, the most expensive, the most polluting? That battery-fired um, energy for homes and for businesses would be a massive opportunity, much lower cost, much more effective, much less polluting. And so those are the s sorts of things that I have in my power to do, okay, to really connect. I cannot solve bureaucratic problems of governments. The governments have to do that. We can't, we can't take down uh, legal rules. We can go and suggest to people, as we're doing now, that it might be a good idea. Uh, when I see presidents of countries or government ministers, I tell them my views, but they have to do it. Okay, uh, this woman here has the mic, and then we're going to do one after that, I think, in the back corner. Yes. Uh, hi, thanks, Colin. Uh, my name is Ndibuo. Um, yeah, thanks for sharing such positive sentiments about the outcome of the ANC conference in December, and um, as well as the, um, the potential um, that South Africa has currently. Um, my question is on um, or, um, the... Um, 
the rating agencies. Um, I know that Moody's will be uh, releasing on the 23rd their rating, mm -hmm. and with the whole land reform issue, um, there's obviously um, speculations that we may still remain, well, with Standard & Poor as well as Finch, we may still remain on our sub-investment sub grade. Um, so I just wanted to understand, do we actually, are these rating agencies working to our favor as, 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 a, as an African country? Because that actually threatens um, consumer confidence if they were com coming back and saying, actually, you're still a junk status based on um, the program that you're going to embark on. Um, another uh, thing that you've mentioned, um, borderless Africa, uh, United States of Africa, um, <coughs> This already on its own, from my own opinion, it, um, it threatens, consu I mean, um, it threatens investor confidence because we highly are dependent on foreign direct investment. And should we have a borderless Africa, United States of Africa, um, since we're not currently creating our own industries, are we not going to threaten ourselves to actually being completely redundant as a continent? Let me deal with the rating agency question, and thanks for that. Um, first, just so that the audience understands what's at risk. Okay? What's at risk here is we have Fitch, Fitch and Standard & Poor's are below investment grade, uh, and we have Moody's with a negative outlook one notch above investment grade. In other words, if Moody's comes out of the rating review with a downgrade, in South Africa will fully loses uh, our investment grade rating from all agencies, and with it, the city gov government bank world, the city world bank uh, government index, uh, South Africa will fall out of it, and there, therefore, there will have to be by the index tracking funds automatic selling of South Africa within that index, losing ten billion dollars, uh, up to ten billion dollars, but around that, almost instantaneously. So. It's both a practical economic impact and it's a sentiment impact. So South Africa is very keen for an outcome. The Moody's effectively takes South Africa off a negative outlook back onto the current investment grade with, um, with the potential for a, a review upwards in the future. And same with Standard & Poor's and Fitch for us to go back to investment grade uh, across the agencies. So that's what's at risk. We actually met a team of CEOs. Mark Lamberti was amongst them with me. We met with Moody's last week. And Minister Nene, the finance minister, is coming on a roadshow, which I'm going to be part of this coming week in London, Boston, and New York, where we're going to see institutional investors. And we're talking to uh, the rating agencies as a team to basically present our case. The land issue we discussed on Tuesday uh, but you can imagine, South Africa has moved significantly forward since the last discussion by the rating agencies in terms of the framework of economic policy, uh, the uh, sentiment, the investment outlook, and the growth rates. So the, we just printed a very positive fourth quarter growth for 2017 print. Uh, and for all these reasons, we're confident that we will maintain our investment grade rating with Moody's. Um, and we have, had, uh, we have explained to Moody's what I said to you earlier, is that there's a range of outcomes. We are confident that the process will deliver a rational outcome, that we're going to be highly engaged in that process, and there will be civil society, business engagement, there will be a legal process, a constitutional process, which will produce an outcome. So, long story short, uh, you don't know how the other person in the relationship is feeling, but you always know how you're feeling, I'm feeling good. Uh, <laughs> So let's hope. Um, how are you feeling? Um, on the, 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 the other question you asked us to trigger me. Yeah, uh, borderless Africa. Borderless Africa. So I, I would just say, just to caution, I'm a bit, I think more EU than the United States of America. Okay, that we're talking about borders being maintained, countries maintaining their sovereignty, but having economic laws and policies which effectively make goods, people, and services move seamlessly in the continent. I can help you with that. 
So I'd like us all to thank Colin for coming and joining us again.